Hi, my name is C2A, and you're listening to the podcast. Welcome back to the anime weeks of the podcast. Well, not really, but uh, funnily enough, uh, the coincidentally last episode we had april hutchins from anna pest uh here on the broadcast and she was telling us everything about her um new album that was heavily inspired by neon genesis evangelion and today we have c2 calling from uh scotland i believe Yep. And, uh, well, he also does some anime-inspired music, especially with his new album, Senpai 3. Uh, hi, C2, how is it going? <laughs> hi, Dario. Oh, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Nice to, nice to speak to you today. So, yeah, we, we, you, you dropped Senpai 3, um, this time a full-length album, uh, on fr Friday, January 8th, and... Funnily enough, this was one of the few releases in in recent times, I would say, that I that I didn't have on my radar. Um, even though I follow you on 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 social media and everything, um, you know the algorithm and stuff. I had no idea that you you had a new album out, and like two days after the release, somebody, uh, a friend of mine said hey c2 has, has a new album out and i said oh i had no idea <laughs> <laughs> i mean on, honestly I, i i don't even know how to how to do it like online anymore because like everything um either has to go like viral or you only reach a certain subset of the people that you're trying to get on your social media so I, i've got a like facebook twitter instagram post there post on my discord server and you know i just kind of hope that the people that want to hear about it hear about it um i mean like a fair few people did hear about it before it came out but the fact that you heard about it after through word of mouth is still cool like that i'm glad that still happens too <laughs> yeah absolutely um but as we as we established uh this is uh kind of uh, yeah the third installment of a series uh the mm -hmm. first two parts were little eps and mm -hmm. now this is a full-length album and you even wrote um a novella to go with it so yeah. uh yeah tell us about it what, what what's what's it about and and how uh, i mean it's so interesting to have concept albums when they're instrumental you know you know what i mean yeah yeah <laughs> uh, i mean where do i even start with the senpai stuff like um I mean, I, I don't know if you're recording video for this now, but I have like various anime posters. And it's funny you mentioned uh, you interviewed someone who was heavily inspired by Evangelion because I have a big end of Evangelion poster like over there, like out of, <laughs> out of shot on my webcam. But um, yeah, like five years ago, I just, um, I normally, I explained this in the preface, the, the preface of the novella, but I normally just, you know, when I get a new piece of gear, like a guitar or like I got a new guitar and an Axe FX, I usually just do mix tests and like try everything out. And I did a couple like more traditional like prog metal ones, and I was just, and I was just like, you know what? Let's just. I don't know why I, I thought about it, but I was just like, let's make something that sounds like an anime opening. So I did like a one minute thirty version of, Senpai, please notice me, which is you know also based on the meme of being noticed by Senpai, and I did that, and people seemed to like it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It was it was very much still in my style, but like I was drawing very heavily on how anime openings were like you know highly energetic like driven rock style j-rock style with a lot of melody so that was back uh, in 2015 right yeah that was back in 2015 so i did that and people liked it i was like you know what? I'll, I'll maybe maybe i should do like a an ep of this and i spoke to one of my friends jack i was still working at the time we were both in the edinburgh office of where we worked and we went out for lunch and we talked about you know what we're up to and what I wanted to do musically. And like, he's usually somebody I bounce ideas off of because he would, you know, tell me if I was being an idiot or not. And this time, <laughs> yeah, he was like, this was the worst idea that you've ever come up with. You have to do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, I um I I did the EP and then like, you know, it was just gonna be each song was based on like an anime trope. So like the first one's like, oh shit, I'm late for school. So that's the image of like an anime girl running with toast in her mouth, running to not be late for school. And then the senpai please notice me, which is based on that meme. And then there was like power of love and friendship as well, which is another like anime trope where you're being beaten by the bad guy, but like, you know, you just remember that you have friends and then you suddenly become more powerful and you win. And I just use those as the song titles, but I was as I was doing as I was working on the album, I thought, you know, maybe I should like, and again, I have no idea why this came over me, but I was like, you know, maybe I should make some anime characters to go along with it. And it'd be like, there's an anime called K-On! where it's just like, you know, girls playing music in a band in high school. And I thought it'd be like that, but like they all play prog metal for whatever reason. Like I have no <laughs> idea what would drive Japanese high school girls to want to play prog metal, but like, here we are. Um, so I made these three characters, um, Megami, Hanako, and Mari for the first EP and I did a really bad set of drawings for the first video stream of that and I also did like some manga drawings for the first tab book um so that became like the first EP and I never like I, I never thought through the idea of doing more but you know I was just like you know I did my next album and then I was like you know what I should I should do another one of these senpai EPs because they're really fun and um they really um, focus me in a different way musically because like a lot of the emphasis is just on like more traditional song structure and melody. So the idea is that like, you want the melodies to be like the catchiest things possible. And they're generally more like upbeat and uh, energetic songs. So um, oops, sorry about that. I'm going to put my phone in silent for the <laughs> rest of the call. Um, but yeah, like I, uh, I did the uh, Senpai 2. And again, it was based on the anime tropes. So uh you know things like summer break and and that kind of stuff and i introduced a new character and like added them with the video stream and it was just you know just another sort of sh pretty short fun ep some fun songs like trying to be catchy with the melody and then you know i did homebound and i sort of took a little break and obviously like things with um covid happened so like i just moved house i um, moved to a new flat back to glasgow where i live now and I was sort of working on and off on the EP. And as I worked on the third Senpai EP, um, first off, I, like, I had the idea that it would be cool if it was a trilogy of EPs. And then as I worked on it, I had more and more ideas. And I was thinking like, you know, I've already done the two anime trope based EPs. I was like, why don't I actually expand what I'm trying to do here and dive into something that I'm, that I'm not necessarily like overly familiar with because I tried my hand with drawing um, with the first two um the drawings aren't great <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna be upfront about that but it was just it was just you know trying to do something different and then for this one i was like you know it's like thinking about where the characters were in the story in advert commas of the first two eps they're you know in their second last year of high school about to you know go to university and you know and 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 so on and i was just thinking like that part of your life is kind of it's kind of very like foundational, like you, the decisions you make at that part of your life when you leave high school, when you go into university or like going to a job straight after school, those can define a lot of what you do when you're adult life. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember when I was that at that point, you know, I was, I, I loved playing music and I love playing guitar, but the reality of the situation was this was not something I could pursue in a sort of professional capacity or like, you know, I couldn't just like drop everything and just try and focus on music because that's an easy way to, end up with no money right <laughs> <laughs> so especially if you were uh, want to play prog metal <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah it's you know you're you're driving yourself to the niche there for sure um but i i was just thinking like you know these characters that i made up will go through the same thing that i did and i was just thinking like i feel like this is a story that's not unique but it's a story that everybody kind of goes through themselves. And I thought that'd be a cool way to frame Senpai 3. So Senpai 3 is essentially kind of almost like a coming of age story for these characters I made. Um, mostly Megami, because she's like the main character. But it's like her path from realizing that she has to make a choice about her future and then coming to terms with making that choice, coming to terms with what her friends are doing with the future, the help she gets along the way and like how she sort of makes a choice in the end about what she wants to do with her future and how it wasn't as black and white as she thought. And there's ways around keeping music in your, a part of your life while also doing things like university and so on. So that's kind of how the, the Senpai 
releases evolved to you know from like a short three song ep about anime trips to you know a story about trying to how you know young people and young adults go into the future and trying to keep passion passion projects and creative things a part of their life oh and uh so how do you go about the, the compositional pro- process uh because yeah do you do uh have the song ideas first and then you think about which chapter kind of or what could happen uh, there or do you have do you have like yeah a specific event in the story first and then you write music to that um so i've it's i've actually I, i fell back to a style of writing that i've done before so one of my albums that i released in 2012 invent the universe is about like the like each song is based on a on a part of the formation of the universe and i found that if i just write out 10 song titles and i look at the title and i visual like i visualize what that would look like and i think like how would you write a song to that i found that that's like a really effective way for me to write because obviously when you're doing instrumental music there's no words so you have to try and convey like you can try to convey the themes and um the vibe and the emotions of a certain topic through just music um so i did the same thing here so i um once i decided it was going to be a full-length record i sort of wrote out a bunch of uh titles for what i think would work and i sort of i actually started writing a bit of the novella as well and i sort of went back and forth with um until i found like the 10 tracks as you find in the release and i'd done some music as well but i actually went back and changed some of that as well um in the end but basically i i think of the title and what i'm trying to what kind of story i'm trying to tell within this uh, within the chapter so before i even finished the novella i had an idea of what happened in each chapter as well and i use that as the basis to write the music and the the interesting thing here is like i'm not working off of, a, off of a blank canvas because you can actually just think of the specific thing that happens in let's say anime or tv shows it doesn't necessarily have to be anime just like broadly speaking you think of the soundtrack for um like say a graduation episode and i can draw on what i know and what i've heard and what i've watched and try to recreate that sense of the sense that that vibe that sound and like that kind of what kind of emotional palette if that makes sense of the story and how the music would support that so i just basically went with every single chapter thinking about that and how would how i would convey the sort of vibe, the story beats the vibe of that chapter through music and how if it would make sense for this music to be in the background of that episode as well. So that was definitely a part of it. And then like with other things, I just wanted to, you know, incorporate my own style of progressive instrumental metal and try some new things like the electronic track um, on track four, Hanako Should Your Manga Spinoff. So yeah, a bit of a long answer, but like, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I actually find it easier when I have that track list and I can I have something directly that I can visualize and try to imagine, and that makes the writing process a lot easier for me. Uh, would you, if, if if someone would approach you who wanted to make this into a real anime, would you would you go along with it, or would you want to keep it as a as a music album and a novella? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say no. I think it, it would be a really interesting project. Um, The, the only the only thing that like would worry me is like how would you differentiate something like this with you know all the other anime out there um but you know if there was interest to to ever animate this or make this a thing that goes beyond just the music i would definitely be interested it's uh um i'm happy with how it is though like it's it's nice and self-contained and i feel like um i'm i'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna say like never say never but i feel like this is a good point to you know end the senpai series because i feel like the The story finishes in a really satisfying way for me personally, so I'm happy to say this is the last one. But you know, if there was ever the interest to make this a thing um, beyond just the music, then I'd definitely be interested. It's uh, th- I've got a few like there's a few f- fans of it in Japan as well. I think they just appreciate the the idea of someone you know who lives in the West, you know, engaging in their culture and you know being so enthusiastic about anime, anime and the manga culture as well. Um, but yeah, like it ever evolves past this, that'd be cool. But again, I'm also just happy with how it is and 
Ja, nej. <laughs> All right. Yes, speaking about uh, the music now, um, you, you already said that Uh, for the senpai EPs, you 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 try to make it, uh, yeah, more more happy. Or you already told us how, how, what you base your musical ideas on, and I think you can really hear the difference between your other releases and the senpai releases, also in terms of heaviness and and all that. Uh, but but generally, when I look at your Bandcamp page, for example, and in, in your bio, you say you record happy progressive metal. I think that also applies to your other no normal stuff, I would say, uh, as it is, uh, yeah, a lot happier than a lot of progressive metal or metal in general. Um, so moving forward or looking into the future, do you have any Uh, will you go back to this, uh, yeah, spacey stuff you did with, uh, you know, yeah, Cassini, Invent the Universe, Set Course for Andromeda and Homebound and all these, uh, yeah, s stories in space? <laughs> will you will you go back uh, to outer space or do you have any, any plans yet um, musically and thematically for... Uh, yeah, music, new music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's it's. I was gonna say like it'd be hard to imagine, you know, thinking about something like new straight after I've released something. But it's like you're always thinking about these kind of things, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I feel like I've um, I've covered the space ground and I've covered the anime ground pretty pretty thoroughly at this point. Um, I don't know if the world needs more anime or space albums or, or releases, <laughs> but uh. I don't know, like, I, I actually, like, one of the things that actually I had the most fun with um, on Sampai 3, for instance, was doing, was the new stuff. So every single track had piano on it. And it was a real challenge, like, because I can't play piano very well at all. But it was a real challenge trying to write the piano in a way that made sense for the human hands and, like, thinking, like, could a human play this in terms of, like, does it fit on your hand? And also like in terms of the more difficult parts that I wrote, like could a real, could, could this be performed? And I would like, you know, watch endless videos on YouTube about pianos, uh, pianists playing piano parts. And like, okay, what I've written is relatively easy for, for the best <laughs> pianists out there, for instance. And then one of the tracks is like really heavily influenced by like uh, future based, like very electronic driven. And I was just thinking like, you know, maybe, maybe for my next release, I should do something just completely different. Like, Because I found that as I've gotten older as well, like my my releases have gotten like less heavy, less metal orientated. Like if I compare like some of the riffs on uh, Cassini and Event the Universe, and maybe even like Set Course or Andromeda to the stuff I'm writing now, it's you know it's a lot less riff orientated, a lot less heavy. I'm less focused on things like riffs and more interested in things like you know the general vibe and atmosphere of a song and the harmony and how interesting chord changes and interesting like uh interesting instrumentation can like add a different level to a song so that's stuff i'm more interested in so who knows what i'll do next i have a couple of ideas you know like mm -hmm. um had in my head that i want to try something more in the vein of jazz fusion but i think we need we probably need less prog guitarists trying to think that they can play jazz um <laughs> uh or something you know electronic or something completely different like i don't know I have a couple of ideas um, and I'm hopefully going to like release another EP this year. because I feel like it's what 2018 end of 2018 was homebound beginning of 2021. So that's, you know, two and a bit years, two years and a month, I think exactly. So I want to get back more into, you know, annual releases. And if that means I'm going to do EPs instead of full albums, I'll do that as well. But I don't know. I want to, I want to, I want to see what's out there musically. because I feel like, I don't know. Like I, I turned 30 last year and I'm just thinking like as much as I love prog metal, I don't want to always play prog metal. And the way that I'm going to stay interested about in music and in, in writing music is to keep doing new things. So yeah. Uh, and, it, 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 and in a way, or like at its core, this mindset is very progressive in itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, like uh, it's the, It's the willingness to incorporate new styles and the willingness to experiment that I think is the definition of prog metal. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I still I still feel like you know, this, despite that definition, there's still a sound to prog metal in general. I feel like that people 
have expectations. And I think the things that the thing that was nice about Senpai in a lot of ways was that kind of defied expectations. Like why would, you know, an instrumentalist guitarist, a guitar instrumentalist who, you know, wrote albums about space suddenly write something about anime. (laughs) Um, So, you know, like breaking those expectations for a personal, on a personal level as well, I think is uh, something I want to keep doing. So like I said, maybe something more electronic or, you know, jazz fusion orientated or, you know, like those are the ideas I've had in my head. Yeah. Or both. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Those are the ideas I have in my head. We'll see where they go, but um, I will probably get like um, probably next month. I'll probably sit down and think about ideas and see what I can come up with. Um, Another dumb idea I had was like, maybe I'll write like an, an EP on stream or something like stream it on Twitch, which might be the most boring stream ever. Cause it'll just be me swearing and doing takes over and over again, but <laughs> it's an idea I had as well. So those are the things that are like bouncing around in my head right now. All right. Um, yeah. T- talking about instrumentation, you, you do everything yourself, right? Which is pretty convenient, I guess in this situation now, because you don't yeah, have yeah. to meet with other band members or, or anything. Yeah. I mean, like uh, I, I've, with with everything that's going on with the COVID situation, it's actually like the most fortunate thing that I do everything by myself because we we all know that you know like music income isn't great for bands, especially if you're on labels and you have if you have you know people who are outside of your band wanting to take a cut of whatever you're getting that's you know already not enough to feed you. But the fact that you know I do everything by myself and I've been a big advocate for smaller artists remaining independent and you know doing things by yourself and taking on the extra responsibility of the you know being your own manager and being your own um doing all your own admin that kind of thing i feel like that's a big thing that's important to me but it's helped me through all of this because financially speaking like you know it's it's allowed me to be much better off than a band that requires touring for all that extra income um because um, I don't necessarily rely on touring for my income and because of the income I get passively through people purchasing and through streaming and stuff like that. And because none of that's going to, uh, a, none of that's going to a record label or a manager that's allowed me to, you know, not worry so much financially, which is a huge blessing. And I definitely like feel for all my friends in the music industry who are struggling right now because they can't tour. I think that's like the hugest shame. And I really, really hope that we get back to being able to tour so that they can actually, you know, get back on their feet so to speak but for me it's um it's all it's been like i've always wanted to take on that extra responsibility and it also means that i take responsibility for how my music sounds coming out like uh, coming out the door and um you can tell like uh, i think I, I i i think it's fair to say that some of my earlier releases did not have the best mixes or the best production but this whole learning to do this by myself it's been a very like interesting iterative process and it really showed me that you, you, you unless you do it professionally of course but like this kind of thing like in terms of learning to mix and produce music it's not something that happens overnight and for me it's been a thing that's happened literally over many many years and i feel that senpai 3 is like the best sounding release i've done to date and i'm very proud of how it sounds but like it took me a while to get there in terms of all the other stuff as well, like, you know, I feel like the drum programming is the best I've ever done. Like people have been asking me who the drummer is. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> there, there isn't one. Yeah, that, that, um, would, that would have been my next question, actually, uh, because there's, there's there's even a, a kind of drum solo at, uh, on the last song, right? Uh, yeah. Anime is leaders to the joy of Mo. <laughs> who is Mo? <laughs> yeah. Who is Mo? <laughs> uh, so uh, Moe is, a, it's, it's pronounced Moe. It's like oh, a okay. Japanese like term for basically just anime kind of it's the feeling of being like compelled by anime essentially so you see like an anime character and like they have moe it's it's a very broad like it's a very broad term that's hard to like directly translate into into english but it's a play on obviously like you know the joy of motion the joy of moe um it's like how you know you have the woven weave as, instead of the woven web so it's yeah. another pun on on that <laughs> but yeah like um i i honestly sat like this is great because I get to watch loads and loads of drum solos and I get to say that's part of my job. Um, but I was just watching loads and loads of drum solos, especially jazz drummers. Cause like they do, uh, they, they, they play drums in a way that I'm not necessarily used to hearing a lot. So I was watching a lot of videos on how they would solo and how they use the snare a lot. Um, so yeah, that was just me, you know, bit by bit trying to 
create something that sounds like a convincing drum solo down to, you know, the loudness of every single note and everything. And I spent a long time with that as well. And it's, it's actually quite reassuring to hear people asking me who's the drummer because it shows that you know at least to them they think i did a good job uh they think a drummer did a good job but like means that the programming was convincing and that was another thing as well and that with a piano too you know people i think some people asked who played the piano and um again it was like program there was like two bits that were really easy that i played piano on and i still went and edit them because the takes weren't that good anyway <laughs> um but yeah, it was just, it was just like, um, I don't know. I, I feel like it's normal for me at this point. Like I'm not, it's not, it's not something I consider like, you know, daunting or anything. It's just this album needs piano, this album needs drums and I'm here. So I might as well just learn how to do all of that, you know? So that's just been how I've worked and hopefully um, the results are good. I think they speak for themselves. Um, do you, do you, um did you already think about when you now that you incorporating more and more piano um once uh live shows will be back do you, you gonna get another band member to play the piano on stage or are you gonna just uh rely on backing tracks or do you think about that already <laughs> if there's one thing that's really that's a common thread with all of my releases i don't think these things through at all i just <laughs> like when I, it's, it's interesting because obviously when you play in a band, you think about, you know, what each band member does. And when I started playing live, you know, I think it was back in 2015 or six, I think it was 2015, 16 was when I started touring. Um, back then, like I didn't think about any of this stuff as well. Like the, it was actually the, the other separate challenge was, you know, I have this music that I've written. How do I get four people to play it live? And like, what goes in a backing track? What doesn't go in the backing track? What do we play? What do we not play? Um, so I guess I will answer that question <laughs> that cross that bridge when it comes to it. Um, obviously we have to work within the economics of touring as well. You know, the more members you take, the more expensive things to get, yeah, sure. uh, things tend to get, um, because, you know, for me, the, the financial burden rely is me. because I don't want these people that I'm taking on tour to have to pay for anything with regards to the tour, you know, that that's covered by me. And then I pay them after the tour, um, so 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 it what, just depend. What was was the tour with Sky Harbor and uh, Modern Day Babylon? Was it was it your first tour? Because I saw, uh, so I, it, I saw you in Munich was, back then, and it's it it must have been a couple of years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was 2016, I believe. Yeah. Um. So that was my first sort of proper tour in inverted commas, because like uh, Sky Harbor had um had booked a tour bus, so it was, it was Sky Harbor, Modern Day Babylon, and me and my bandmates on that bus and that was the first tour that i did where we actually like you know just went to a different city every single day um earlier that year i'd, I'd been in japan so we did three shows in japan but that was very it was a very comfy tour compared to you know um and even even on a uh, even on a tour bus that's incredibly comfy but uh that that tour was like you know like we were in a hotel every single night and we just you know took the 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 shinkansen the bullet train mm -hmm. to osaka when we finished the two shows in tokyo um that that's who was supporting protest the hero which was wow. kind of wild like yeah. like my first ever time overseas playing music i was in japan <laughs> uh supporting protest the hero and on that tour was also Let's reflections see. and a japanese band cyclamen hayato is the was the promoter of that tour um and i know him very well and he he was actually in glasgow and asked me if i wanted to go on that tour um wow so so yeah like uh that, but that was my first tour in advert commas but like we were really really looked at well looked after and like i said like two shows were in tokyo and one was in osaka so like we just stayed in a hotel the first night in tokyo and then we took the bullet train to osaka and um stayed in a hotel that night and got to basically be a tourist the day after the final show while all hung over after our last show nice. um so that was like that wasn't didn't feel like touring because like when i was yeah, um good. when i was with sky harbor that was you know a show pretty much every single day and that was you know th like that got me into like the routine of touring because while it's fun being in every a, sit a new city every single day the routine's pretty much the same you know you show up to a city you wait till the venue opens you load in you sound check you find somewhere to eat or the venue gives you food if you're I was going to say one thing about European venues, they, they, they treat you a lot better than venues in the UK. <laughs> so generally we, we get fed and given a few beers before the show in European venues. And then you play the show, then you pack out, sell merch. And then like, it's, it's a very kind of routine thing. So I would say that that was like the first tour where I experienced that. 
and after you've done it once you kind of just get used to that routine and you kind of expect it and it becomes normal but that was a very new experience when i was uh when i was doing that with sky harper for sure yeah yeah it, it was it was kind of a very 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 special uh unique evening here in munich because um the sky harbor singer got sick and so suddenly we had an instrumental triple <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was that's another thing as well like i n n like eric he's a, f a f phenomenal vocalist but like uh it's it definitely takes its toll having to do that every single night and it's not it's not easy and i definitely feel for singers who because like those schedules are not built for singers at all But people like to make the economics of touring makes it so that you pretty much have to be playing a show every single day to to maximize the income that you're getting. Because any day that you're not playing a show, you're paying for transport, you're paying for drivers, you're paying for all of this stuff, but you're not getting any money in return. So trying to make that break even, bands tend to just play every single day. And like talk about singers, like when I toured in in the US, my first US tour supporting Haken in 2017, mm -hmm. like that was an intense touring schedule. Like I think uh, we played 27 shows in 31 days in the wow. US and Haken yeah. played something similar. I think there was a week where they went off to do some festivals and stuff. And I think Ross, the singer of Haken, got a bit of a break then. But yeah, he was pretty much just having to perform a one and a half hour set every single day. I'm just like... Guitars are easy. Like these things, these th your fingers don't break. The, your fingers don't get the same fatigue like your vocal cords. So that yeah. was just, it was incredible. But um, but yeah, I, I can't even remember what the, what the question was. But oh, it was about how <laughs> Scott, how you got the this the triple instrumental set. But yeah, that was a it was a fun night. But like obviously, like uh, like you know, like it just there were some days where Eric just wasn't able to sing, and that was a shame that the Munich night wasn't that because you didn't get to hear him sing, but you also got to see something unique in, in, yeah, in the instrumental set as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope we can we can talk about new live adventures at one point. Mm -hmm, I, mean, sure. I, I had the, the pleasure of seeing you again in Paris with um, Intervals 2019. <clears throat> that was right? a fun show, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was really, really fun. And yeah, as I said, I hope we can make more live adventures at one point. Uh, for now, the, we're reaching the end of our interview, but at the end of our, our episodes, we have a little section that we call What's in Your Walkman? So it, I, would, okay. I would like to ask what you've been listening to. Is there anything that stood out that you want to recommend to you, our listeners and to your fans? Uh, I mean, like, uh, I'm, I'm, opening, I'm opening up Spotify just right now just to, <laughs> just to double check. Uh, so uh what have i been listening to uh so i think obviously i like to support and hear what my friends in the industry are doing you know, a fellow instrumental guitarist obviously uh it was circadian by intervals and impulse voices by plenty that came out recently that are you know really fantastic albums and i recommend people to listen go listen to that uh chimp spanner that's actually a name that uh was a big influence back on me when i started back in 2010 2011 and Uh, he's recently done two singles, Tombstone City and Aurora, I believe that they're called. Um, one's on Spotify, I think the other's on um, on Bandcamp. But like, just uh, it was just really nostalgic to hear Chimp Spanner produce music again. Not like, oh uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, see that as well. So, so I'm gonna check that out definitely. Yeah, I mean, like uh, his album, um, what was it Into the Dreamscape? Is it called At the Dream's Edge? At the Dream's Edge. At the yeah. Dream's Edge. Yes. Like that was that was 2010. So that's like. A, almost 11 year old album but like that was such a huge influence on me when i was starting out because he was doing the same thing he was like you know self-produced artist so yeah he's he's put out some singles which are really cool um i've been other than that like i've been i tend to just put on a song and just go with spotify radio but i've been listening to more electronic music like um Tennyson, i'm a big fan of anomaly so i've been listening to stuff like that i've been doing that thing that everybody likes to do where like oh i'm a i'm a metal guitarist but i don't listen to metal but <laughs> i've been falling into that trap um yeah i've just been listening to some some of that uh you know just uh I, like i said i i uh i think the most metal album i listened to last year was probably palimpsest but palimpsest by protest the hero like an absolutely fantastic album like i think if uh I know I'm just a huge protest fan, so I'm just a big <laughs> fan of everything they do. Um, yeah, that's what it. Is. I'm trying to find the last and back. Like I've got a lot, a lot of a few K-pop songs in here. I won't mention those, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think that's probably what's in my Walkman. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I got I got some metal uh, entries for what's in your Walkman that also <laughs> uh, are connecting to you. So one constant uh, in my listening rotation last year was Lucas De La Rosa's EP, Sunlight mm. Highlights, where you guessed it on the track Sky, yeah. obviously, which is a lot of fun to listen to. And also got the the kind of anime influence <laughs> with yeah, that, yeah. With that like kind the, of chorus. Especially the track that... I, I, yeah. I feel like he did that intentionally. The track that yeah, I was on, he, he gave it a bit of an anime <laughs> opening sound, yeah. And... Um, yeah, well, I also went back to uh, your live guitarist, Leah McLaughlin's uh, mm -hmm. band, Orinthia, and their fantastic EP, Immersed in Lucidity, from 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, when I was uh, yeah preparing for this interview and, and kind of got, got back into your discography and, and yeah, set course for Andromeda, of course... Um, yeah, it reminded me of uh, one of my favorite prog metal bands called Andromeda from Sweden. And on their 2003 album, Two Is One, they have an insane instrumental track called Morphing Into Nothing. So that's uh, so I'm going to put that one also on, into the playlist for you guys to check out. Uh, thanks uh, for taking the time, C2. It was, was really fun talking to you. All the best with Senpai 3, and I'm looking forward to what you're, you're going to come up with next. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking today, and uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, hopefully I will see, hopefully you guys, well, hopefully you guys all enjoy Senpai 3, and hopefully at some point in the near future, I'll be able to see you guys on the road. All right, great. Thank you guys out there for listening, and as always, take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, and listen to great instrumental music. The Progcast is a production of Stuus Media and is presented by the Prog Space. It is produced by Randy M. Salo, Janine Stengel-Lewis, Blake Lewis, and Dario Albrecht. Our theme music is by This Is Not An Elephant, and Van Kirsch does our graphics. New episodes of the Progcast drop every Monday and Thursday. And don't miss our Friday Top 5 episode where we discuss our favorite new releases from that week. For more interviews and reviews in the written form, check out theprogspace.com. <laughs>